So Patricia will open, we'll tell her a few stories, and then we want to engage everyone. How did we how did we get here? Well, thank you so much for staying. I think I should say that again. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I thought myself I might not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, my, I thought I would say what happened to me uh, and, and how I got to where I am now, but, and I hope that's interesting. But Paul and I practiced Zooming, and we, got, we had so much fun going back and forth, we decided to try to get there as fast as we can. Just, oh, yeah. I met Ivan Illich in 1970 in New York City, for those of you who know him. And he said, you must come to Mexico this summer at Cuernavaca, uh, where he located himself after he got excommunicated from the Catholic Church. And um, there's going to be a group of people there uh, talking about the quaint title was Technology for Democracy. And uh, come in August, it'll be great. So I arrived in August. Of course, it had happened in July. He gave me the wrong date. And um, I asked people about it, and they said terrible. It was awful, evil, all evil people, really bad. And I met one man who said it was fabulous. And so I married him. <laughs> I, did. I did. And he gave me a tape of, it was Herbert Broom, if I remember correctly. and. It just blew me away. I was in a master's program in sociology at the time. What I heard there so unsettled my mind gloriously. I happily got two C's in the next semester. One paper I wrote was Science is Ideology, and the professor said, impossible. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you know, we've come a long way. I forget what the other one was, I got to see him, but I don't. So uh, I wrote an essay, and they let me have a master's and sent me away. And the, <laughs> yes, the, truth. And the husband and I, um, the husband had been Rodney Clough, some of you may know him. Uh, he did some of the, uh, the images in Cybernetics of Cybernetics. Wanted to go to BCL. Can give that a lab in University of Illinois. I said, well, that tape was interesting. I'll go with you, of course. We were married. And so we went. And when I arrived, I always remember Heinz came uh, to Stephen. What's Steve's last name? Somebody? Sloan. 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 Who? Stephen Sloan. 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 Stephen Sloan. We were staying with Stephen Sloan because we had no place I'd to stay. I love the man. And Heinz came and said, Where's the wife? And so I appeared and he said, I've been out all day sweeping the streets of Champaign Urbana for you all night. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't know whether I was going to take to all of this. I really didn't always know what was going on. And as I said a little earlier, Heim said, This is great. Um, you have no background, really, so you can be a creative mind. And after getting two C's in a graduate program, you know, that was really helpful to me, that he thought I could have a creative mind. When, I arrived, when we arrived at, in Champaign-Urbana, Heinz had uh, invited Rodney there and me coming along for a, a proposal he had submitted to the Navy. I think it was the Navy that often uh, uh, mm -hmm. funded, uh, called a College of Cognition. They turned down the proposal. So when we arrived, I said, there is no money. There is no College of Cognition. And what really happened after that was just a bunch of kids. I mean, we were really young. <laughs> At 27, I was probably older than some of the people that were there. We. We, we created, because there was no program anymore. And we did finally create Cybernetics of Cybernetics, that huge book. A bunch of kids, the most beautiful creation that you haven't ever seen, and it's really amazing. It's, I have copies. It's quite wonderful. Not with me, write to me. And I was telling Paul recently, the queer theorist and critical theorist, Eve Sedgwick, has written about cybernetics as this period being the cybernetic fold, when there was really no technology. I don't think we ever 
I never touched a computer while I was at the biological computer lab. We were imagining all the time. We imagined what the machine could do, and if the machine could do that, what could the human being do? And if the, if the human being could do that, what could the machine do? And the way we imagined that was to choose as many kinds of vehicles as we could find. Art, music, dance, anthropology, sociology, politics, epistemology, uh, ontology, to think through what this movement between the human and the machine, the cybernetic fold, which I've always really loved that idea. So while we were a bunch of kids, nonetheless, people visited the biological computer lab. So I spent lots of time with Gordon Pask, lots of time with Chico Maturana, lots of time with Herbert Boone, of course, who was there. And when I said people argue, Maturana and Boone used to like to argue over mm -hmm. politics, of course. With Boone, a group of us read Das Kapital while, we, while I was in PCL. <laughs> I can imagine that. Yeah, we did critiques of capitalism, critiques of art. It was just fabulous, and it just went on all the time. There were no classes, really. Mm -hmm. We would sit around. We'd sit in Heinz and Maya's house. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we'd sit in classrooms also. And I can remember Gordon coming once and just filling the blackboard all, <laughs> all around the room with, like, little storylines and uh, key individuals. And Gordon's wife, <laughs> Elizabeth Tass, was always around also. I want to say very quickly that uh, for myself, Heinz and everyone around him, but Heinz, is, Heinz especially, and I don't think I appreciated, I did appreciate Heinz so much, but you know, Heinz was sort of the master of ceremonies. So it was always someone else he was pointing to, and so someone else to listen to. So I just took him for granted in that way, that he sort of was the director, the leader of everything. One of the things I didn't notice about him was that he was working his way through philosophy. Because we didn't use the machine very much, there was a great deal of discussion about philosophy. The philosophy of mind, the philosophy of science, the philosophy of mathematics. But the philosophy that people were still working out in 1970 was kind of positivism, how to move away from positivism, kind of post-positivism. When I left, and I mentioned that, you know, um, Wittgenstein, Heisenberg, maybe. I, for, I forget exactly. I remember Wittgenstein a lot because he's related to Heinz somewhere in the family. When I left BCL, I got a job. Well, I had a baby, which did a few things. Uh, and then I got a job, a tenure track job at Fordham University. And it was in sociology. And they really didn't promise that I'd ever get tenure. And I really wanted to get tenure, of course. So every time they had some new course to teach, they said, would you teach it, Patricia? And I said, of course, yes, I will teach. I'll do anything, right? So they gave me the course that was newly developing called Sociology of Mass Communications. So I didn't know anything about television or film, so I said, sure, I can do it. And it was while teaching that course and learning about film and television, which I want to get back to in a minute, that I realized that cybernetics and technology should be part of mass communications. I was ahead of my times, because certainly we were not thinking that way at BCL. Uh, the technology was not communica mass communication technology. If I'm right, I don't remember that we discussed it very much. But it sent me into film theory, which uh, was dominated at the time by the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. And that led to the French, Derrida and Foucault and Deleuze and Guattari. And so the philosophy I went from cybernetics to was not at all anything that was happening at BCL. 
that wasn't what was happening because they were of a generation that was really working on something else, which was important to me. I mean, I totally learned. When, when Matt Tarana did autopoiesis and explained the organism's relationship to the environment, I mean, it ruined my mind. <laughs> when I would go back to sociology, I would say, no, 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 that, no, that kind of thing. No, we already, you know, there's some other way to think, you know, that's, that's really something else. And what I remember about BCL, which I've been thinking about the day and a half that I was here, we were always imagining possibilities, really, really stretch. I feel sometimes like I'm still realizing things I heard mm -hmm. in BCL, still realizing in disciplines that are way behind psychoanalysis, uh, sociology, <laughs> biology. You know, it's still happening. Uh, in, in a way. Post-structuralism and this, when I read Derrida on page nine he, of, of grammatology, <laughs> he mentioned cybernetics, and I thought, ah, cybernetics, there it is. And because I wasn't thinking about it so much anymore. It was now, you know, in the late 80s, and I was thinking much more about the French. And Derrida had an, an idea that has really shaped most of my work that came originary technicity. And by originary technicity, it was a deconstruction of Heidegger, of the distinction between nature and, tech and culture, but nature and technique. Fusus and technique. As n neither nature nor technique could be originary. So although it was originary technicity, if you know Derrida, there was a big X in, in over originary. What that meant was that all of human nature was always already technical or technique, mm -hmm. not nature as opposed to technique. But not only human <coughs> nature, but all nature, all matter. So one of the things that originary technicity brought uh, with it was the noted notion of indeterminacy. That not only was nature indeterminate or humans indeterminate, because indeterminacy is hugely important. Input, output, no. Input, indeterminacy, output. I mean, this was, you know, second order cybernetics, but already first order cybernetics, that there's something indeterminate between the input and the output very important for politics, very important for thinking. Nobody just reacts. There's always an interpretation, something in there, indeterminate outcome. But not only human nature, but all nature, but more than that, all matter. So that matter is indeterminate, which became for me, matter is self-informing or informational and drawing on information theory and all that came after it, the notion of a dynamic matter. And I think this is really important because I heard some things today that, you know, in my world of critical theory, we would not say anymore that humans have agency and that it's what's special about humans. Uh, that all of a, everything has an agency to it because everything is indeterminate. And so there's always some process that goes on in the movement of time, let us say. To think of, and this is my last thing, and then we'll talk after Paul tells about his. Um, to think of something like matter as indeterminate or dynamic means that it's open to an entanglement with new technologies, as is biology. And this is really important to me about how we critique digital technologies, generative AI. We must start from understanding we're already entangled in technicity. There's no technology out there and we're over here and that we could just be against it. Any critique of it has to start with this notion of originary technicity, which uh, is really a derivative term. And that has been one of my 
thought. I had some arguments with Matt Tarana about this. Matt Tarana is so much fun to argue with because he never gives in. He's, <laughs> he listens, he smiles, but never gave in to me. That, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this in the past. I'm sort of doing other things now, but about the organism being closed to information, as he would argue. And I, I think that there's something that we need to rethink about the organism, and certainly to think about the body as not reducible to the organism, but as something else. A little bit, so we can move it around. Wow. <laughs> wow. What wow. does it get? Thank you. Amazing. You're welcome. Uh, you know, the people that I, you know, it's very interesting because um, cybernetic, in the world of critical theory, which has really been my career, and this theory, post-colonial theory, um, critical race theory, you know, um, those politics as part of knowledge production, uh, part of performance and ac action. Cybernetics has been um, only thought of as terrible because of its relationship to war technology, its relationship to discipline and control, its relationship to surveillance, its relationship to capitalism and to global capitalism. And it's been hard over the years for me to remember the cybernetics that I met and the gifts that were given to me in biological computer lab, as I said, still thinking through them, to, to also face those critiques, which of course can be made whether you call it cybernetics or technology. And I've held out, I, I really have held out for understanding the complexities of technology and its entanglement with the human, and, and, and that there's um, a better way to understand that entanglement than just think it's bad. I, I do think capitalism is bad. Um, Herbert Green <laughs> would insist that I, <laughs> that I learned that. In 1984, Paul and I met, and in 1984, I won some kind of, I don't know, NEH grant, I think, to go to a conference in Champaign-Urbana, it just happened to be, um, called Marxism and the Interpretation of Culture. Mm -hmm. And there was a tremendous interesting overlap between things on my mind, you know, structuralism, and Marxism, and media technology. Um, and, and being involved in film and television gave me a, um, I, I'm sorry if I'm jumping around too much, gave me a, um, a head start in understanding cybernetics and social media because I was doing communication technologies and television and film. I was ready to start talking about social media very early. The algorithm, years and years, most of my graduate students had worked with indeterminacy of the algorithm and how it works. And, you know, so it's always, um, the critique for me is always about finding where indeterminacy is and supporting that in whatever arrangement we're holding. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Question? Yeah. Uh, were the biological computers fireflies running fat? Foundries, or what were they do? Pardon me? Yeah. I didn't hear. Was that? Were the biological computers fireflies running foundries, or were they you? They were me. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some, I think, lovely, if I may call them that, contrasts here. I read every book in the library before I got to be an undergraduate about computers, because none were available. <laughs> And when I entered undergrad in 69, I had been the product of a brother who was very engineering and science and tech oriented, fixed all the cars and became an architect and an urban planner and a developer. And another brother who introduced me to Wagner and Eric Satie and J.R.R. Tolkien and all of the things that we think of as a humanistic world, although they both crossed over. And so when I got to MIT, I thought, wow, I'm going to be able to play with computers, which I did a bit. 
and I wanted to sit at the feet of the priests of AI of that era, which were Minsky and Papert. And I took the classes, and I was enthralled for about a semester or so. And then I realized that what they were worried about was how to make the machine into something humane. And in an intuitive way, this was unsatisfying to me. And I couldn't articulate how it was unsatisfying until I met Gordon Pask. And he was a consultant to the Architecture Machine Group. He's working with Nicholas Banco Ponte. And he, I believe, although Nicholas will never admit this, even if I ask him with a straight face, I believe that it was Gordon's ideas about conversation that was the seed of the Architecture Machine Group, which was, can you have a conversation, not an interaction, not a Q&A, but a conversation with machines about designing? Not telling the machine to give me a rendering, or how fat should the beam be, or you know what color is commonly used, or even now today, pattern generation. But what are we trying to do here, and why are we trying to do it? And what are the goals that we might have, in the sense of what do we wish to achieve with the building that we're designing, and how do we go about modifying that? And so it was clear that Gordon had what no one else that I could find of the time had, which was, of course, a form of cybernetics. He called it conversation theory, etc. So what I expected upon first coming across cybernetics was that this was 1976 when I met Pax. Great, a couple of years, we'll be doing conversation machines, architecture machines, going to keep going, it's going to be great, you know, and in a few years, we're going to really have a rich, collaborative, co-design relationship with machines. That's what I expected. What I got was crickets. <laughs> Nothing. The architecture machine itself had already started morphing into this hardware software lab of new experimentation. We had the first commercially available touch screen, which people said was never going to work people from the government who had funded us. It's never going to work because you can go all those smudges on that. <laughs> True story. And we also mounted it on strain gauges such that it was pressure sensitive, which was an innovation we brought so and so forth. So not having gotten what I wanted uh, continues to amaze and disappoint. And what I want to do now is fast forward to today. ChatGPT, generative AI. Mm -hmm. You know what my reaction to that is? I get nauseated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, oh my god, how wrong to give the bluntness of that. You, famous person who brought back neural nets, for saying over and over again that these large language models are really close to being artificially generally intelligent. Give me what are you smoking? What fame are you seeking? What money do you need to satisfy your ego? So the question is, what do I still want? I still want conversational machines. I want a cybernetic viewpoint on these things. I want a humanities and technology, a science and soft. I want an analog and digital synthesis. That's what cybernetics always was, growing up in that era of people saying, oh, neurophysiology and brains and neurons and stuff like that. That's called, well, we got this digital machine over here, and it's got zeros and ones, and it's going to compute. But our computing is pretty powerful. And how, what is that a, a computing equivalent? Oh, McCullough and Pitts, we're going to do this neural net thing, and we're going to build a theory, and we're going to say, theoretically, neural nets are equivalent to Turing machines. And by the way, neural nets are like brains, and Turing machines are like computers, other people said. Minsky and Papert said. Therefore, computers will be brains. And wrong answer. It's still a wrong answer. So I still want sensibility. Sensibility of the humane, sensibility of the analog. I want common sense in, oh, come on, we're Somebody said recently, we're statistical creatures, because that's what the brain is based on, and therefore these LLMs, which are statistical, would be smart. 
What are you smoking? I don't get it. I just don't get it. So what I hope for, and what, as I premised early on, I still want this, and the question is, what needs to be done that I haven't done in order to get that? I'm not sure. I'm trying it here. I'm offering it as a question, if you're interested in that question. What are we not doing that we need to do, that we might learn how to do in order to get somewhere that we haven't gotten yet, which is to be sensible about this thing called intelligence, which is not a property of a box, but a property of a relationship? Can we change the culture sufficiently to revise its errors of thinking that rational cognitive thinking is the answer to everything, so that's all we need? A colleague of mine asked me to get in touch with a, a current author who's written a bestseller called The Anxious Generation, which is about the difficulty that young people are having with social media and all of the things that come with the distortion of living. My colleague Peter Tudnam is interested in I am too in the fact that children today don't know how to go outside and play because they've been like this so much of their lives. So, what to do differently, I don't have an answer for, but I invite all into the conversation. And I don't think it's appropriate now to go into what was it about PASC or what was it about cybernetics. And I don't have this glorious set of moments that you had at, at an earlier stage, at a more important stage, but I do want to say I had the disadvantage of having computers in front of me mm -hmm. in an era when people would be confused by what computers seemed to be doing, but you at the BCL yeah. had no machines, <laughs> so you had your imagination. As Dave said a moment ago, what was the biological computer? It was you. Yeah. You know, the notion um, that it was called the biological computer lab has come back to me many times. What was that idea, biology and computer? Now, I have to say, and we've had this argument before, I think, I slightly disagree with you, but how? Uh, you know, this is really tricky, you know, how to take what I was saying about where we start, what we assume, and what we stand on when we critique. So while I'm not about to, um, you know, as a psychoanalyst, Certainly, I hear all the time about the growing anxiety among kids and the difficulty of working with children, never mind crazy adults. But um, <laughs> I think the problem with the algorithm and, and generative AI it is what's been done with it, of course. Because what's really important to notice is that it's not thinking like humans are, but it is doing something we don't do. And it is doing something we can't do. And it uses indeterminacy to do it. And it belongs to the lineage of cybernetics. And so it's, we're in it. I love this argument. Why, why do it well, come to the disagreement? Because I, I would not say, what are they smoking? Or what are they doing? As you did. Okay. Of course. Good. You're not as dismissive as I like to be. Yeah. Well, I'm not as theatrical as you can be. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> At least I can't sing as well. Are you saying I'm purely theatrical? Are you saying there's no substance there? No. So uh, I take it quite seriously that there's something like uh, an artificial thinking that is not like the human. I think the real problem is that we keep on thinking it's like the human or better than the human, yeah. rather than its yeah. own thing. And that it is, um, you know, it, it belongs to something that we're developing. It is, I think, an ontological move on biology and on cognition. Yeah, yeah. You're more sophisticated about all this than I am. I'm just more afraid of it. Yeah. Well, that's why I said I want to be really careful. Of course, 
you know, and if, if some of my students were here, they would say, you know, but Patricia never touches computers. That's why she loves them so much. I learned my lesson at the, yeah, I mean, in my office, it's like, hey, somebody come here. I can't get this thing to, to work. Um, the imagination is very important. You know, that's yeah. what I learned, and, 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 I, I, and, I, and I've kept it. Yeah. And engage imaginatively with with what we ourselves are producing, because we are. We're not producing it alone. We're my friends back there. You know, the the investment of capital in the, is really a difficulty. It's fantastic to hear that you were reading Capital in With the Herbert Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come across in Capital is this idea that the technology isn't this autonomous thing, but actually is an embodiment of our social I'm relations yeah. and mediates our relationship with the non-human world. Mm -hmm. And so to answer, to kind of yeah. sketch an answer to, to what you're asking for about, well, what should we be, be doing? It's, you know, unless we change our social relations, our, our technologies that we produce will just keep damaging us and our labor. Not only though, they'll feed back to us what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, Mark talks about how technology has a couple of, it's always going to, yeah, he has this idea of, of subsumption, basically. You know, it will strip our skills away and find ways it will appear to remove lab the need for labor, but will actually just create a lot of worse skill levels, basically, needed. And, you and know, of course, and, so and, that's what, you know, we're seeing with, with and also. We have to be careful to beloved to me, Marx, every word of it. <laughs> but a certain epistemology and ontology, you know, that I that you could one could be critical of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I think but we've got him to bring to Marx as yeah, well as yep, 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 as, yep. as well as we need to remember right. what he said. Yeah. Chantin. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just love that you guys brought up John Kabir's book, The Ancient Generation. Because I look at the graphs in that book. Which book? Uh, Anxious Generation. Anxious Generation. Yes. Uh, I think it relies primarily on graphs that look at social isolation and the emergence of cell phones. And yes. Depends, right? yeah. I just, you know, the thing that I took away from that book is that we need to create scenarios that allow kids to understand how to navigate real using technology. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But also, of course, allow them to you know, play outside or like not use them at school. I understand that. But I feel that there are also ways to create these scenarios in classrooms, in protected bubbles, that allow them to understand how life is improved. What example? Well, an example that I would give for a scenario would be maybe be in a maybe a 2D or 3D immersive curriculum about something like food security. Right? Where the kids get to food use food. Multimodal tools to understand what a food desert looks like and how they would. So, you know, I have, yeah. uh, you know, grandchildren who are teenagers, and, you know, they're totally engaged with their phones and what we're speaking about. And they also understand the, because they're learning it so young climate change, indigenous populations. I'm, I'm thrilled with what my grandchildren come out of their mouth. And while they're talking, the phone never leaves their hand. I mean, they are originary technology. But I agree, there's so much teaching that must involve the technology. I'm sure we all agree with that, that there's a lot that's troublesome, but to take, to not learn with it in, in their hands. Right. Yeah. Yeah, a, a portrayal of what you're asking for, I think, is available online for free in a novel by Vernon Dingy called Rainbow's End. Set not very far in the future where the advances in medical and information accelerating so much that kids are eight year olds are routinely studying the sorts of things that. Uh, research assistants right. they are now team training. Right. Mm -hmm. There's dangers. What danger? I said that just to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so that's being nice. <laughs> you just meant it as a threat, but you didn't want to go into it. No. 
No, I, I, I sometimes forget um, that they're dangerous. So I'm trying, I see you trying to remind yourself, including suffering. Jeff? I'd love to expand on the dangers. If Go ahead. Um, you know, I think we've seen, we've already experienced the danger in that these tools yeah. exist only because they've hoovered up massive amounts of unconsensual data, unconsensual mm -hmm. language, unconsensual yeah. images, unconsensual video, unconsensual audio, and so on and so forth. And energy. And these tools have yeah. simply emerged with massive amounts of funding and, you know, sort of work that you're talking about of, you know, how can you be so critical of cybernetics of being so associated with war, being so associated mm -hmm. with destruction, yep. being yep. associated with evil. You know, I would argue there's just as much of an evil in whole-scale theft. You know, there's just as much of an evil huh. in yeah. denial of consent completely of smashing and grabbing and asking for an apology later and, you know, waiting until you're yeah. so set up that, you know, you just can't be argued against. Hmm. Um, Jude, did you have your hand? Yeah, I, I don't want to shift, but I want to point to something you said, so I will shift for a moment, if that's okay. No. You talked about information and Maturana's definition of closure, and we need a new theory, and it's past, pa well, well, yeah, I'm going to try. Right. Past talks about the elements of a, per a participant. Although I tend to agree with Chicho about formalization. I took care that a whole lot of research effort would not be wasted by making sure that my participants in a conversation or in a more general phenomenon which might involve corporations, might involve savvies, nations, politicians, whatever, could be identified with participants, every one of them, if they had these simple properties, organizational closure, informational openness. And I would agree with that, and I think Maturana might agree with it if information or when information is defined as a difference that makes a difference which is determined by the inter-whatever of the organism at hand. The third thing... Evolution in a mystery. You would well, say. sure, I would. That is, I don't know what time it is, <laughs> nor do you. And I don't believe in it anyhow. It's a very simplistic view of the world. Now, that's my first point. How long do I have? <laughs> Another 15 minutes. Could you give me a five minute cue? I will. Thank you. Uh, now, I don't believe in time. I really like this contrast that you mentioned. We have computers. Uh, I don't remember the word you used, but we have computers. And then you could play. And, and, and or imagine because you didn't have the computers. I really like this contrast, and I wonder if you could somehow interpolate, interpolate this more in, in, with the intention to see what could we, ah. if you would go back to, your, to these times as kind of uh, mentors of yourselves, uh, I don't know, have a conversation nice. of four, something like. I, I can start with that, and maybe you can keep going. So when you have this technology in front of you and everybody's telling you that it's getting smaller, cheaper, faster, and it's amazing what you can do with it, you become part of it in the sense of you think within its constraints. And if you only have your imagination, only, he said, if you don't have this machine in front of you whose constraints are bearing down on you because you want to do something with the machine, then I think your imagination is an opening of possibilities rather than and a constraining and a making within what the Turing machine can do. And remember, that was a really impoverished era compared to what we do now. I'm tempted to tell stories, but you know, when I was a boy, our <laughs> machines were 8K. <laughs> and we couldn't have any real discs, Listen, you know. we had cars. Well, yeah, I refused that. I, I, took, I started taking that. 
But what would you say about that distinction in terms of Adler's question about what, where was the limitation of the imagination, which if you had had a machine, you might have paired it. What I would say is I would have forced myself not to think in terms of the machine and to spend perhaps an equal amount of time thinking, well, what do I really want to do independent of the constraint that I'm worried about making this thing run without bugs? So. Yeah. Um. <laughs> My mind went crazy for a little while. I have to come back to it. Because uh, the machine wasn't n not there at Biological Computer Lab. It was always being imagined. Mm. And there were constraints on that imagination um, that came from, I think, mathematics, which there was plenty of. And, neural nets and I mean there was a beginning of thinking there would would be a machine but the notion that the machine is a machine is what what we didn't let me say again it isn't that there wasn't a machine but even when you talk about the computer the machine is something you know uh, I think of Deleuze and Guattari the machinic um, that which is artificial, uh, that which is not, that is primary, it's technicity, originary technicity. So it, it's not um, that kind of a thing. It's how you can machine something, how you could mechanize, you know, make something, how you could bring forth the artificiality where you think it isn't. Yeah, I, I really like that. Okay. Uh, I, I want to just, because there's so many things we don't think are artificial, but they are. They're uh, not just constructed, but they're, um, they're, there's um, always prior planning, organs. There's a way to always think that you're in the process of machining which is imagination. Yeah. To follow up on that, and maybe you can help me with this, Herbert Brun supposedly in those days would go to the machines, because mm -hmm. the engineers got off at five, he would say, and then he would go in and play with them and, and generate. Stuff. I mean, it, talk about imagination. He had an imagination with the machine in the sense of the kinds of music that he would put out, mm -hmm. and you can, and you can have access to that music because there are CDs of this sound waves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he used that imagination in relation to his use of the machines. Mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s. A, a different cultural approach, in a sense, because when I'm thinking about what I was trying to do, I wasn't framing it as a creative act in which. Mm -hmm. All of Gen AI and so on uh, brings me up. Shantanu, you had your hand up earlier, but have we drifted away? No, no, no. Not at all. I, I mean, maybe sort of, but I just wanted to bring up the dangers, right? Of, um, I'm looking at this from the point of view of perspective shooting, right? Through the use of machines and like collective studies for children, right? Because I'm an educator. Um, and so, like, when I talk about immersive education, I speak from experience, right? Because we did two. As part of like a federal grant when I was in my PhD degree um, with kids in Ohio public schools, and the flack that we got from parents was, "You're engineering my child to think in a certain way with these machines, right? To take up a perspective that is political, that 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 has social ramifications, but we're giving them the content and allowing them to take those perspectives themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just emergent, but but it can be construed in other ways." Is how I look at the dangers, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. pure chaos that can emerge. Oh, can I tell a story? Sure. Please. Before I went to BCL, I was a second grade teacher in a Catholic school. <laughs> I had 58 kids in my classroom in second grade. And we used to have uh, education on TV, which was this TV on this big iron thing you had to pull it backwards. <laughs> it was terrible. But because there were so many kids in the school, we had uh, ships. 
So I actually taught from one to four instead of nine to three. And I had the brilliant idea of watching television that the kids watched after school in class so oh, that yes. we could talk about it. Mm -hmm. This is in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It wasn't I smart, but I already <laughs> knew uh, Marshall McLuhan, who right. had already impacted right. me a great deal. And you know what happened? The parents complained. Right. Yes. She's watching TV with the kids. Uh, they didn't and understand I, it was a I pedagogical trick. I couldn't explain trick. to them what we were doing. It was a pedagogical trick. It was trick. brilliant talking to kids about what they saw yeah. on the TV. Yeah. Yeah. How did you diffuse that? When, when How did we diffuse that? Was too. Well, it was one crazy parent, and it led us to withdraw from two schools on a federal grant. Yeah, you had to. So we couldn't avoid it because it's a school district that's publicly funded, right? Peter, do you have a comment? I wanted to ask uh, about the great diaspora of cybernetics thinkers that emerged from your experiences, all the other people that you touched. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm appreciating hearing you know, about the luminaries, but I think that there's also you know, hundreds of thousands of people that have been inspired and I mean, so beyond, you know, so beyond Brian Eno, um, there's his whole circle, so he's be popping up that were all also touched by the same thing. They embedded cybernetics in different ways. And and I want to say they used it, like I've heard you talk about methodology too or something like that. It became embodied and embedded in their practices. And they didn't even talk about it, but it's evident. Um, it, and it's probably so I wonder if you have a sense of how it spread from from your your perspective. Especially called from like the cybernetic organization that worked even with the sun and all that. How did that expand like now to the new generation? I mean, that had to change the way people were thinking about things then and, and then grow into mm -hmm. other practices. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating by mm -hmm. who's not in the room that actually knows this stuff and is using it and just not talking about it as sophisticated ways as you are. It's hard to grab onto that question, and it's quite sophisticated. The example that Peter mentions, for example, when I was at Sun Microsystems, in one of the few periods in my life in which I worked at a company um, that was not my own or startup or something, um, with colleagues, we developed a way of thinking about leadership, and language, and the creation of new language, and the role of that in innovation, and so on and so forth. And we gave copies of this little gray book, as we call it, to everyone in the marketing department. <laughs> and it didn't go any further than that. So it was a hashtag fail. Why? I, I don't have time uh, or necessarily even the reasonings for it. But it was a classic case of individuals and organizations keeping themselves as what they already are is resistance to change mm -hmm. to conventional thinking. Um, we had ways of proposing to a 40,000 person organization, which Sun was at the time, uh, how to make change, but we were not in the right position. If we were the head of it, if we were Bill Gates, Bill Gates turned Microsoft completely toward the internet single-handedly, because he had the power, he's at the mm -hmm. top of the hierarchy. But the question is always, how do you do that, et cetera? You could say, well, you have to be Margaret Mead and realize that it's a small community that changes things. So, so I, I can't easily grasp that. You're asking a question that's a bit yeah. beyond. So I guess in general, and help me with this paraphrase, BCL, yeah, yeah, what happened? Why didn't it keep going? What, what BCL? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I can't remember the the dates exactly, but I realized that when I arrived at BCL, it was no longer getting funded. And I didn't know what MIT was, but I think Pine said something like, they didn't under, I remember what he said, I didn't understand what it meant. It was like my first conversation with him. They uh, thought that we wanted to do a tape recording. He, they didn't understand what he, must have proposed. And he mentioned MIT, where they were going to make um, little um, um, 
machines that hit the wall. <laughs> like those, like turtles or I mean, he, he realized that mm -hmm. the money was gonna go some other way. And so I, I of course, being so new to everything, didn't realize that I was sort of in the wake mm -hmm. of something um, of biological. You know, I, I want to say that I have actually chaired 48 dissertations in my history as an academic, and every one of those people, um, every one of those students, who most of whom are now professors, full professors, have heard about cybernetics, have heard about the biological <laughs> computer lab, you know, have a certain real deep investment in trying to understand technology, how to treat it, how to think about it, how to teach about it. And, and I think that's really, it's an, a hugely important task um, at this point in, uh, in our history. Someone who hasn't spoken first before we repeat? Institutionally, <laughs> I don't, I think it was a surprising occurrence. Uh, you know, PCL yeah. was in Champaign-Urbana, um, you know, who would want to be there, but they were there. And the people that came through were, oh, my favorite story, you know, I really love Goddard Gunter's work, as you know. And Heinz knew that I did, and I had read it and thought I understood a three-valued logic, which I had been after all my life, three values rather than two. And so Goddard Gunter came, and Heinz said, you can come to lunch, but you shouldn't talk. Yeah. <laughs> I said, why? Oh. Are you ready? He said, I don't think he thinks a woman can think about these things. Oh. You know? yeah. There's, There's still that people that think go? that. What? There's still people who think that way. Yeah. <laughs> I did talk, I think. <laughs> I, I don't think I. Did you just, persuade him? I forget. Uh, that's uh, the story's yeah. too good to remember what happened that time. <laughs> well, he changed his mind too, didn't he? Yeah, but I think that was a rare occurrence. What, what happened when I was at the biological computing lab? Because it wasn't being funded, it became really creative, but it, didn't, <laughs> it can't survive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I just wonder whether the perception. Of Also explain why, although a little later, the Soviet Union also decided it was regarded as too harsh. I, I'm not sure. Um, the story that Stuart Umpleby knows better than I do and has written about it, uh, but I, we would also hear Heinz tell this story. I'm sure there are other people in this room who would firsthand know mm -hmm. what I'm about to say. Heinz said that. Year after year, when he wanted money for the BCL, he would go to Washington, he would come back with the money. And one year he went there, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, we're gonna consolidate all of the money that's going to stuff like yours, AI and so on. And you gotta go talk to that guy, and he's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So Heinz goes up to talk to Marvin Minsky, expecting to have the usual allocation, very modest, I'm sure it was, for the BCL. And Marvin said no. And it was that simple. And, and that's what he told it. And it was a terribly important moment because uh, it reduced cybernetics to Minsky and what they were doing at yeah. MIT. Yeah. And which we, lit, led much more to things like understanding surveillance and technology, right. which was not what was BCL. What did Minsky say? What did Minsky say? Why? I don't know. I don't think he had to. Yeah. He was already part of the movement that didn't want to use the word cybernetics in 1956 when they had the famous Dartmouth conference and wanted to take a cognitive psychology approach. Is that the right word? Uh, a cognitive approach to AI and to keep going the symbolic route. And they consciously did not use the word cybernetics and wanted to not, you pick your place on the spectrum, 
wanted not to acknowledge it, wanted to repudiate it. And that's where the phrase artificial intelligence came from. And I knew Minsky a little bit, uh, undergraduate right. classes and so on, when Pass came to uh, Cambridge to uh, consult with Nengra Ponte and with the group Dark Mac when I was their architect for um, It was clear that Marvin knew in his soul that the answer to intelligent machines was what is now still called symbolic AI. So this world, you got a doorway, you got a knob, the knob's relation to the door is such and such, which is to stick that in a database and then add some reasoning on top and we're gonna get intelligence in five years. And they said five years every five years for 50 years. <laughs> and now they're still doing it with AGI and so on and so forth with neural nets, right? They're just repeating the same thing. What do they smoke? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and where do I get it? I heard from Ernst von Glasserfeld's story yeah. that it had to do with second order, in the sense that second cybernetics led to ethics and responsibility, and there's no way the military wanted individuals to take responsibility for their thinking and doing. It could be that in and part. And that what happened was with yeah. that, that there was a split within cybernetics, according to Ernst's story, where there were certain people decided, no, 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 I'm a researcher, I don't affect what, and they went off and generated this new thing called artificial intelligence. intelligence. Rather than second order. And it's said by those who knew Wiener, Gordon Pass among them, that Wiener knew all about second order and consciously chose not to right. forefront it, knowing the peril that that would place him in, in terms of wanting to persuade people. We learned, a Heinz taught us that about it. And he wrote that letter to the military when they were looking for his papers, and he said, I'm sorry, I'm glad you can't find it, and I'm not helping you because you're too much into industrial militarization, so goodbye. And post, post Hiroshima as well. And the lessons of the trade union. Then there, you know, uh, there is also the, the story about Gary Gunder. You know, it was... The what version? My story about Gary Gunder was meant to also as you said, Judy, uh, it was men. There were women, but it was male. You know, Still is. Yeah, uh, um, male Silicon dominated, Valley. and I think it makes a difference. Silicon yeah. Valley, the bros. Jeff, did you have something? Well, I just couldn't imagine something more illustrative than you, know, you ask a relatively simple question of, well, well, why? Why is that funny and why? And the answer is power doesn't need to be a reason why. <laughs> power. Yeah. Operates from a place where yeah. you can scream why all you want, yeah. find it therapy wise or otherwise, and yeah. it simply won't answer. It will yeah. stop and laugh and yeah. move on, or simply not notice at all. Even more upsetting. Yeah. I, um, I laughed when you said that, but I really wanted to cry. Yeah, and, and you know, I just. <laughs> Sometimes I, I think it, it's it seems like you know, a, a discipline so, uh, I don't want to say obsessed, but you know dedicated to the idea of asking those questions to run into, you know, that kind of brick wall. Um, that's upsetting. Yeah. So I'm still obsessed by this question of what we still want. I would like to ask you that question. What do we still want and what might we do differently in order to try to get it? What we want or what do I want? <laughs> I'm, I'm addressing it. Well, yeah. What you want. I, tell you. I, went, I went from my, you to we and I apologize. What do you want and what would you suggest be done differently? Um, did you see what I did? Yeah. What? What? Yeah, I did. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was still thinking about power and uh, the great, great moment of Louis Foucault on power to remember that power doesn't just come down, but is force. So, you know, it sets off a lot. And so we have to, we have to uh, remember our power and how to use it. And, um, I don't, you know, I don't think Heinz cried over it not getting funded, mm -hmm. we we went forward and did cybernetics of cybernetics mm -hmm. and created sure. and I, I didn't really know until later, wow, that was the end of BCL that he was telling me about. I, did, I remember saying to him, what do we do now? And you know, I just, I remember, I, we hold on 
by the edges of our fingers. <laughs> it was so dramatic, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that is. Yeah. No, you know, my, my new world of trying to make a difference is psychoanalysis. Why, I have no idea. But um, I'm, I love the, the unconscious and the thought of the unconscious and indeterminacy as uh, profoundly undermining human superiority and agency and the whole thing of cognition. You know, probably one of the things that DCL did not appeal to me, it was too much about cognition for me mm -hmm. and not enough about, I don't know, something else. So um, psychoanalysis and psychotherapy is so alive in our society and I'm, I'm not sure what the, I, the ideas there could use some messing around with. So that's what I want to do. That's I, the path. I, yeah, that's a path for me to, yeah. to rethink therapeutic mode, to move away from treating the individual and yeah. instead to see them embedded. Yeah. Any other comments? Please, Kate. One of the things that I think a lot about, and you may see, and Paul, you often ask about cybernetics and where do we go, and is it dead, is it alive, whatever. Um, but something that I often think about is just being joyful. And that's why I came to this community, really, because in some of my other academic communities, lovely as they are, um, there was just a lovingness in this particular community that just made everything feel so dynamic and so resonant um, and so performative in the sense that that I think of performance as a violinist. Um, and so I think, where am I going with this? I guess I think that this, I, I run into a lot of issues with cybernetics. Um, I'm, you know, uh, working on a book and in a tenure track position, and there's a lot of resistance to it. It seems like there's a sort of allergy to the word. Yeah. And I say, you know, why? And it's funny, the, the answer to that is usually fairly ambiguous. There's, I can't get a great reason for it, something to do with problematic past, whatever. And I say, well, you know, I have these colleagues and we're very loving, and, you know, I work with this guy, Paul, and, you know, we sing sometimes. I mean, it's nice, you know, <laughs> but it's, there's just, there's some sort of resistance. And so that's why I like to keep talking about joy and fun and love, which mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, frequently comes up. Jean, you bring that up a lot. Play, playfulness. Playfulness, playfulness yeah. Um, you know, yeah. So uh, there wasn't much there, but I guess I just wanted yes, there to. Was. There was. I would like to sing. Always. <laughs> <laughs> but that is what I'm going to take. Um, Can I tell one story about you? Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, Please. Yes, yes. Please. Okay. You Which and you one? That is. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I met Paul like two years before tenure, remember? I, yes. So I had such a writing block. And I, I wanted to say something about writing. Uh, you have a writing same. block? Oh my God. Kate, I think we were talking about this, that one of the most difficult things to do is to change the writing form of a discipline. Mm -hmm. Psychoanalysis mm -hmm. writes the same, every, <laughs> every paper is the same, and it's really hard to get published. You can see it at that place of creativity, because of course that's where the canons are made, that's where all the rules are made in writing, because when you're talking, it's great, but writing, you have to get published to get tenure, you can't just be smart. And so I had so much trouble thinking the way they wanted me to think. Are you not gonna remember this? Keep we, going. We were in New York together, and I said, let me, let me tell you about this book I want. And we walked all over New York City, and I told him the whole book. Mm. The entire book that became ends of ethnography. Yes, which was mm. the I didn't. It didn't get written before tenure. I got tenure anyway, but I, I knew because I had told you yeah. that there was a book there. And yeah. it was a deep book. Yeah, I loved it. I loved <laughs> yeah. every minute. I remember walking Very deep. around. All over. Fifty Ninth Street. Yeah, Fifty Ninth Street. Yeah. 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 Yeah
what's the title? The Ends of Ethnography. It's pretty deep. Her first book. I love that little book. And we thank you for your time.